the beauty of the church. <clears throat> I want you to look at the people around you. Those in front of you, behind you, either side of you. Maybe a few rows in front, a few rows in, in, in behind you. Do you think of them as family? I hope you do. If you don't, I hope that you'll, you'll strive towards that, you'll work towards that, because in our scripture reading just a minute ago, Jesus said we're family. Jesus said, everyone who does the will of my Father in heaven, that's who my mother, my brother, my sister, that's my family. And you're here this morning because you love the Lord and you're, you're striving to, to implement his will in your life. That means that we are family. We're family. The relational aspect of church family is so important it's beautiful it's meaningful it's deeply significant and while friendships may come and go these relationships last into eternity these relationships literally last us the rest of our lives not just here but in the life after we will be together forever. What great and, and significant relationships that we have with one another through our faith in Jesus. But we have our differences, right? We have our differences. We've come here this morning with different experiences, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different perspectives, different family units. Our families are different sizes and they look different ways. And we need to be aware of the fact that our adversary, the devil, he wants to magnify those differences. He wants to highlight those differences. He wants to, to keep us from being church family. He doesn't want our church family to thrive with loving and humble and gentle and patient and encouraging and forgiving relationships. That's not what he wants. His desire is for us to feel lonely and isolated he wants us to feel divided and a disconnect from church family he wants us to to fight he wants us to bicker he wants us to complain and argue he wants us to focus on our hurt feelings because we focus on hurt feelings and and the troubles and the problems it keeps us from focusing on Jesus Christ and him crucified that's what he wants And so the Bible warns us, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And when we're focusing on the things that make us different, or we're focusing on hurt feelings, or what someone said, or what someone did, that's exactly what the devil's doing. He's devouring us in that moment. He's severing family bonds and ties that Jesus died to bring about and to strengthen. My family loves me. And there's several reasons why I know they love me. They know my strange quirks. It may shock you, I have some. <laughs> they, know, they know my strange habits. They know embarrassing stories about me. Don't ask them because I know embarrassing stories about them. And they would never betray the family, right? <laughs> They've seen me at my worst. They've seen me lose my temper. They've seen me say things that I, or heard me, seen me say things I shouldn't say. They know and they put up with all my corny dad jokes that I have. And by the way, Ava has the best sense of humor in our family. She laughs at all of them. And in spite of all those things, they still love me. They still love me. Family is supposed to be safe regardless of how good the good is and how bad the bad may be or how bad it may get. But sometimes in our church family, there are members in our church, there's some sitting here this morning, part of our church family, that don't feel as close as they want to. Did you know that one of the top reasons why people leave one church family and go to another church family is because they feel lonely. It's one of the top reasons. 
And it shouldn't be that way. But it is. So what can we do to strengthen family ties? How can we strengthen an already loving family? I'm not insinuating by any means that you are not a, an unloving family. You're not. You are a very loving and accepting family. But what can we do to strengthen those ties? That's what we're interested in this morning. I'm glad you asked the question because that's what I'm, we're going to talk about this morning. I'll give you four things that are, are fairly practical that you can begin to put into practice immediately. The first one is a little more conceptual, but, but I think it, it, it's, it's still easy to understand. Number one, we have to embrace the family dynamic. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verses 4 through 8. Paul says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Embrace the family dynamic. Paul compares the church family to the human body. The human body has lots of different working parts. Some of our parts are stronger than other parts. Some of our parts are more visible than other parts. Some of our parts seem to be in constant use over other parts. Some of our parts seem to be more important than other parts of our body. But that doesn't make one of them more significant than the other. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If the eye says, well, um, I'm not an ear, you know, and he makes some different comparisons there. Just because somebody may be a little uh, uh, less, or seem less significant, I don't want to say they are, may feel that way, doesn't mean that they are. Amen. I mean, have you ever tried to feed yourself without using your elbow? I mean, you don't, you don't recognize how much you use it and how important it is until it doesn't function the way that it's supposed to. And so Paul uses the human body in, in, in the church and makes these comparisons. And Paul says the, the church family functions in a very similar way as our human body does. And we need to embrace the idea and the spiritual fact and reality that we are part of a church body. We need to embrace that. And wherever you fit into that, you need to embrace that. We don't all fit into the church family in the same way or in the same place. There's diversity in our church family just as there's diversity in our human body and the way that it functions. Some of you have been members here for decades. Some of you have been members for only a few weeks. Some of us <clears throat> are extrovert, extrovert. Some of us are introverts. Some are teachers. Some are encouragers, some are servants, some are leaders, some are nurturers, some are or organizers, some are good at cooking. Some of us, let's face it, we're good at eating what's been cooked. <laughs> but you fit in, right? Somebody's got to eat it. <laughs> Figure out where you fit in to the family dynamic and embrace that. Embrace that and use what God has given you to encourage and build up your spiritual family. And if you don't know where you fit in, come talk to me. Come talk to one of our shepherds. Go see one of our deacons. They have something for you to do. I promise. They got a place for you to fit in. They got a place for you to serve. They got a way for you to encourage. They got a way for you to to build up the kingdom here at Woodland Oaks. So number one, embrace the family dynamic and, and, and live in that. Number two, work to be more authentic and honest. Take a deep breath. This one's not easy. There's a great need for more genuine relationships in our world. More genuine, authentic, caring, thoughtful, considerate 
relationships. And where better to find them than among God's people? People who are honest. People who, who do their best to love others. No matter who they are or where they come from or what they like or what's in their past, they work to love and to serve others because they love God. And they want honest relationships. But sometimes, we're not completely honest. Now, I'm not calling you a bunch of liars. It's not what I'm saying. But sometimes, we're just not as honest as really as we want to be sometimes. Authenticity, uh, authenticity is a character trait difficult to display because it demands of us to be vulnerable. And it's difficult to be vulnerable. It's hard to let people to see into our hearts and into our minds and give them a glimpse of, of sometimes who we really are. Authenticity is hard to find because we live in a digital age where virtual is, has become reality. Right? And it becomes truth, whether it's true or not. The virtual world allows us to put forth a depiction of ourselves and even of our families. It isn't completely true, but it becomes truth. At least it does to others. The virtual world has allowed us to filter out the bad and present only the good or the perfect examples Perfect selfies, perfect smiles, perfect hair, perfect makeup. It's all flawless. And if there is a flaw, then we have a, a filter for that as well. Perfect dates, perfect meals, perfect children, perfect parents, perfect vacations, perfect holidays, perfect marriages. And we can go on and on and on. Because we only want people to see the best. We don't want them to see the ugly side of life. But what's so... strange about that is all of us have an ugly side of life all of us have flaws all of us have problems every family has struggles most of you probably had one this morning before walking out the door <laughs> or taking a picture out here okay we're getting out of the car stop right We've said that. We've said that. And it's not that, it's, not that it, it's wrong to do that. I think what is wrong is when we don't share that with others. And let them help bear our burden. And we help bear their burden as well. The virtual has allowed us to filter out the authentic and the real and the rawness of life. We need to remove the I have it all together filter from our lives and let people see the real us. We all struggle. We all have problems. We all have, we're all stressed at the end of the day. We all say things we wish we wouldn't have said. It doesn't okay, it doesn't excuse those things, but it goes to show there's just a, a fact of life. You, you know how the conversation goes because I've had the conversation. And I've probably had it with you and you've had it with me. We meet each other at the door in the floor. And you go, hey, how you doing, Sean? Man, it's all good. Everything's great. It's good. <laughs> Wonderful. See you later. Yeah. You've had those conversations. I've had them. But you know that's not all there is to the conversation. That's not all there is to life. Colossians 3 and verse 9 says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices. And again, I'm not saying we're all liars. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just encouraging you to be more real. To be honest. Let others bear your burdens. Help others bear their burdens. We are to have the same care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 25. And bear one another's burden, fulfilling the law of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 2. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Honest conversation, real, authentic uh, conversation can only take place in the building when we're practicing fellowship outside of this building. This is not about whining and complaining and griping to one another. 
This is about sharing real struggles of life and asking for help and asking for prayers. But it can only take place when we enjoy real fellowship. I encourage you to practice fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As a child of God, we are in a relationship with, with Jesus Christ and the Father. And because we enjoy that relationship, he immediately puts us in fellowship with each other. Everyone who's a child of God. And so John writes just a few verses later, chapter 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are in a relationship with each other. We are brothers and sisters of one another. We are members of one another. We are adopted children of God together. And walking in the light pictures, it gives us the picture of transparency, which takes us back to to being authentic and and honest with, with one another. And that word fellowship, it means communion. It means joint participation. It means a sharing that takes place in each other's lives. It's a spiritual term that conveys a deep, mutual sharing and partnership in a common cause. And for us, it's the cause of Christ. We work together to promote Jesus and his church. Fellowship was a big deal to the infant church. They persisted in this communal aspect of Christianity. And our love for Jesus, our mutual love for Jesus, ought to foster that among each other. And and, and true spirituality, it manifests itself in community where we are able to serve one another, teach one another, love one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, all the uh, one another patches. I think there there was 37 I I mentioned last week. Look at Acts chapter 2. It allows us to to stir one another up to love and to good works. Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Fellowship to the early church was so much more than a Sunday morning thing. It was an everyday thing. They were together every day. And if they weren't able to be together every day, they were together as often as possible. They loved one another. they, They embraced the family concept of wanting to be together. Fellowship accomplishes a couple things. I'm going to give you three very quickly. Fellowship builds a level of understanding among each other. I get to know when I fellowship with someone, and it's more than just eating, but eating's a great place to start, I guess. When I fellowship with others, I get to know the personal background, family history, their family dynamic, their spiritual history. I get to know their heart, and this helps me understand them and relate to them, which then develops compassion. It helps me develop compassion. One of the biggest, I think, and and best benefits of being together is getting to know people on a more intimate level. I just get to understand them. And then I begin to, to understand and find out what they struggle with or what stresses them or what problems are going on in their life. I begin to understand the difficulties of their life, which allows me to develop and extend compassion to them because I understand them I'm relating to them and I I can extend compassion but it also helps me then bear their burdens bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ Galatians 6 and verse 2 fellowship is crucial to the church family dynamic number four pray with one another pray with one another 
Acts 2 and verse 42 tells us that the early church was devoted to prayer. All throughout the book of Acts, we see Christians praying with one another. James 5 and verse 16, we read it a minute ago. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. When you talk to God on behalf of someone else, you are inviting God to work in their life. What a powerful concept that is. And don't just pray for one another. I would encourage you to pray with one another. Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. I love what is, is going on here. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, they've been arrested. Uh, they've been kind of put into prison. They've, they've been uh, given a harsh scolding and they've, they've been let go. And then verse 23 says, when they were released, they went to their friends. You know who that was? That was their church family. They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, listen to this, they lifted their voices together to God. What is that? They prayed. They prayed with each other. In verse 29, here's one of the things they prayed for. And now he said, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants, this church family, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The first place they went to to share their struggles was their church family. And they prayed together. Not just for each other, but they prayed together. Prayer is calming. Prayer is stress leaving. Prayer uh, brings um, people closer and it invites God into your life to work and accomplish things because you can't do them on your own and you're relying on Him. When we're honest with one another about our struggles and our problems and we live in fellowship with, one, with each other, naturally, we're going to pray together. It's a natural, it's natural. You can't help but be together as church family and not pray together. If you don't, it's a symptom of something far greater that we need to discuss. It's going to bring you closer. And when you're close, you rejoice with those who rejoice and you weep with those who weep. And you pray together. That's what you do with family. You've probably heard it over and over. You'll never find the perfect church family. I take issue with that. I take big issue with that. The church is exactly what God wants it to be. When the church operates as family, and they love God with all their heart, and they love other people, that's a perfect church. Doesn't mean it's flawless. Doesn't mean it has people that aren't, don't have their problems and don't struggle. That's all of us. But it's a church doing what God wants it to do. And I thank you for being the perfect church family. Not just for my family, but for everyone here. The local church family will always have its issues, just like my family. In your family. But we can do better. We'll close with 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Paul writes to the Thessalonian church and he praises them. And he talks in, about how great they're doing and how receptive they were to, were to the word. And how they were teaching the word. And, and how they were doing everything the way that they were supposed to be doing it. And listen to what he says. He says, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. They were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. But have you read ahead? But we urge you, brothers, do this more and more. He says, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Let's keep doing it. Let's stretch ourselves. Let's do it to the best of our ability. Let's keep going. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and keep doing this more 
and more and more. And I think the implication is, don't forget, you're doing it together. You're not doing it by yourself. Christianity is not an individual thing. The Bible makes it very clear it's a family thing. Because we're family. And family takes care of family. This morning, I don't know what stress and what struggles and what problems that your family may be going through, but I could take a good guess because I'm part of a family. And my family goes through a lot of the same things that your family goes through. But we're here for you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you. We want to keep you on the, the, the right path, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. So if there's something in your family that you need help with, or you need the prayers of the church with, we would love to help you, and to love on you, and to pray with you, and to pray for you. If you're here this morning, and you're not yet a child of God, you're not part of God's family. We would love to study with you. Maybe you've studied on your own or with someone else and you're ready to put your faith in the finished work of Jesus for the very first time and become a child of God. You can do that this morning by repenting of your sins, being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of those sins, raised to walk a new life as a child of God. Whatever your need is this morning, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.